קצת אנדר שטיינשטיין ותת הזדמנות, אז הנושא שלו הוא 100 דיו 70, או בעברית אולי 100 כשבעים. תודה על המארגנים שהזמינו אותי. אני מהיום, כמו שאומר פה, אני נכנס לגמלאות, אני נכנסתי לאוניברסיטת חיפה. היום רשמית זה היום הראשון שלי. זה לא אומר שנטשתי את איינשטיין, זה אומר שאני אעבור לעוד 12. And the title for what we call the 100, the Nisendian, the reason it calls like this is because we think, or my hypothesis is that uh, the real 100, the people who reach 100 are really 70 years old, and I will try to convince you during my talk, but they are 100 in age, and not, uh, they, are not 100, uh, they are not 100 in physiology. So I just start with <coughs> just for acknowledgement that uh, well, if I won't have uh, the time at the end of my talk, this is to pay a tribute to the people who involved with this work and the institute that founded this project. And as you can see, more, all of them are from the uh, United States, so the work was done in, at Einstein. Okay, so let me give you some fact about people who are 100, and what you see from this slide is that during the last years, or if we look cross-sectionally from 65 to 100, we see that the amount that people uh, put to buy either treatment or drug or medicine during is reduced with age. So this is one example that might uh, raise the hypothesis that people who are between 95 and 100 are more healthier than people that are 65 or 70. It's close to one third of the amount they spend on health at this last age. Another example of what I just show is that during the 100 years old, I'm talking about the last two years before those guys died, is like one third, as I said earlier, 24,000 versus 8,000. The 100 years old guy are spent on health uh, associated either drug or treatment, $8,000 versus 24,000, uh, the people who are 60 or 70. And this comes to what we did like a long ago, nine years ago, what we saw is that we divided our population, and I will elaborate more in the next slide, um, that we have three population. One is the problem, which are the centenaires, or 95 years and older. Then we have the, their offsprings, okay? And then we have the control, we are, which are unrelated to the problem and to the offspring, but they are 30 years younger, okay? So if you look at those groups, you look at the percentage of hypertension, you see that the problem are the same prevalent as the control. The same happened with diabetes, myocardial infarction, and stroke. If you pay attention to the green point, you see that the offspring are much healthier uh, compared to the control. Uh, and this was shown not just in our study, in multiple uh, places. Then uh, I want to show you about lifestyle. So what we learned from the previous slide is that control and centenarians are the same level in the sense of prevalence of age-associated disease. Next, we look at the lifestyle, okay? So if we look at the compare the uh, centenarians to the uh, control, I have a pointer here. By the way, I, I thought when I'm coming to Israel, I will speak in Hebrew, but anyway. Oh, no. uh, what we see here, if you look at smoking cigarette, there's uh, differences between <coughs> men's 
uh, exceptional long live are uh, smoking less, but the female are smoking the same. Consume alcohol daily, they are the same. Uh, regular motor physical activity, activity, basically couch potatoes, so the exceptional long lived versus the control are not significant, the same as in the female. Diet, they eat the same, okay? Let's move further. Um, BMI, they are obese. If we calculate the percentage of the uh, people who are, who, who are overweight or obese among the centenarians, there is like 45% of them either overweight or, or, or obese. Compared to the control, you see it's uh, here it's a little bit less, but see here, and in the female, they are a little bit more. So what we learned from those two studies, two slides, is when we're talking about lifestyle, there is no real evidence for the support that they live a different style than the control who are 30 years younger. This is a picture that, who, of, that was uh, of a um, family that all the siblings reached to 100. The difference between the two pictures are 80, 80 years, okay? If you look, <coughs> the boy are still alive. The girl died. This died at the age of 102. This is 109. She's the longest lived. And those two are still alive. This less than this one because this is very vibe person. He's the oldest broker in the world. Still go to Wall Street every day. He is part of the partner of a business that runs $700 billion a year. He's the one that accepts and the, any newcomer is the one that gives you know, the, the report if it's good or not to invest with him. And, then as, and as you can see, he still can uh, uh, shoot a rifle. Okay, so another slide that uh, uh, example to what I'm saying that 70 is uh, the new 100 is this guy. See, this is 100 years old and this is his son. You see he still has, this is his own teeth. This is not new. He, look at the uh, skin. There's not that much of wrinkles. Okay, he still smile on after 100 years old, so probably there is a, a reason for it. And what else we can see? He doesn't have the hearing aids. Lives in the same house. Okay, and I think we can see some black hair around here and here, but anyway. Uh, maybe it's because he was one of the designer of the aspirin uh, uh, drugs, so that's why he's happy now. <laughs> look, at, look at the 70 years old guy. This is his son. If you, if I wouldn't say he's 70 years old, you assume he has like 50, right? No? Yes, yes. Yes, yes, okay. So from all this bunch of slides, what we saw is that environment, probably it's not the reason for longevity in those old age couples. So what else? What else? Genetics, right? In order to do this genetic thing, we uh, actually near Basel, I had started this study in 1998 before I came to the lab. And uh, so far we recruited uh, 540 centenarians, um, 750 control, 750 uh, offspring, DNA, and so forth. And the reason we collected it's from Ashkenazi Jew, there is a bunch of reason, but from genetic perspective, it's because it's a population, it's a family structure population with genetic, it's, let me rephrase it, it's a pop, um, family structure population with genetic variation of population, okay? 
when you do this genetic study, you like to do it in a family structure because you can see the link between <coughs> the parents and the offspring. So if you have family structure, it's much easier to look for the genetic links, right? So when you do it in Ashkenazi too, there is uh, phenomenal um, evidence that those, uh, this population raised from a very narrow stem, like 400 years ago, from tens of thousands of people of a founder, and it raises into a couple of million before uh, World War II. So when you do the analysis there, you see that there is a more uh, homogene uh, homogeneity in terms of genetic uh, disposition or genetic background. And indeed, it's easier. So that's why we try to do candidate gene approach. How much? Ten. Uh, so when we try to do genetic uh, candidate gene approach, I'm talking about starting ten years ago. There wasn't the old GWA study that uh, people are uh, doing today, or not post GWA study that people do today. So we started with the CEDP, as you can see, was published in JAMA 2003, and the criteria to go into or to classify as, as age-associated gene, we have four criteria. One is case control association, meaning it's not prevalence of one of the variant of the gene is much higher at the long leap versus the shorter leap. Second, there is a trend analysis, meaning there is increase of the prevalence of this variant with age, meaning the population weeds out the deleterious uh, allele or gene. And then buffering analysis, which is more, it's another 25 minutes to explain what does it mean, but the, let's say the lay idea is that the longevity gene buffer the deleterious effect of the aging gene, the one that killed the population and let it grow. That's why you see the U shape. So we have case control, trend, buffering, and then the phenotype. If there is beneficial phenotype associated with the variant that we classify as age, uh, gene that associated with a age. Uh, Age benefits. So in the CTP, all of this classification was more, were more. Apple C3, we are only in three. Adiponectin, TSA, which are only two. And now we are with the deletion in a gross hormone receptor. That's what uh, Chaim just mentioned about, you know, the, the link to the IGF-1 uh, pathway. And we have more that we continue with this. But, when you do candidate gene approach, you can do it for 20,000 years because each gene takes five years to cover all the aspects that you want to do with association, right? And since we have 20,000 genes, we need to do 20,000 years or times five, it's 100,000 years to find out all this connection. So looking for this, uh, like in 2007, the era of the uh, GWAS or the genomic uh, screening for multivariant that you do it in parallel uh, has arise, and we get the advantage of using it in the um, one of the arrays of uh, Fumetrics that was uh, not the first but was the uh, best back then. What we did is to look for uh, case control. If you remember the high and the low, we wanted to do it in parallel on million spots on the genome. We all spots that cover the whole genome, but we wanted to do it unbiasedly. Not like candidate gene approach that we look for specific gene that people before us do the link. We wanted to look at everyone at the same time. The problem with this is this guy. See? This is the threshold that uh, kill every program and it kills a lot of billion dollars. Why? Because when you do a million comparison, you need to adjust 
in order to <coughs> make sure that the link is real. So if it's not passing this 10 to the minus 8 association, then you're doomed. So in order to gain this, it's either the effect should be very large between the two alleles or two components of the same gene, or you have multiple people that you do the same uh, analysis. In order to do this, there, is, uh, there has been established a lot, a lot of uh, consortium. For instance, there is a consortium that uh, we are part of it, of diabetes, that have 250,000 all of them GWAS. And then you can see this effect of one to two, and think, okay, this is nice, and it has to tend to the minus eight because it's a lot of people. Anyway, the message from this slide is after so much money drop into this pool in order to find this association, even in a whole genome aspect, the uh, element of the genetic that the people found or the, uh, they reported it was between 20 to 25 percent. So what we learned from the couple of slides that I mentioned earlier is first, environment doesn't really affect aging. Second is the genetic can provide very limited explanation of the variation with aging. Okay. So what left? In the last couple of years, or well, it was there like 40 years ago, uh, Heim Sider, which is uh, one of the uh, uh, running uh, uh, people for the Nobel Prize this year, uh, talked about epigenetic or methylation. And he talked about it in the 60s. So what we left is the epigenetic, which means the interaction with your blueprint and the environment. So there is some uh, curtain that is between the environment and your genetic that help you cope with different environments and let you live longer. So in 2005, uh, Fraga et al. published um, a, a way or a system to measure difference in epigenetic uh, uh, predisposition, he took a twins two years old and a twins 50 years old, and he compared between those twins, what he saw that between three years old to the 50 years old, there is increase, uh, like exponential increase of methylation, of changes, that can say there are some interaction that uh, increase with age. In 2013, actually this year, this study was expanded into a couple of hundred people, and as you can see, with age, there is increased increase methylation, but they stop at the age of 90. So our question was, what happened at the age of 100 or 110, which this is uh, the population that we study? Either it's increased linearly, <coughs> doesn't change after this 90 years old, or even decrease. I want to open um, sublime, uh, parenthesis. parenthesis, thank you, and explain a theory that uh, I thought can uh, uh, give an example, give a, uh, will un let us understand why centenarians live longer with association to epigenetics. The theory that I'm presenting to you today is called the switch theory. How I switch? Okay. And what's, what does it mean? If you have one link, as you can see about epicytes, and you have one switch, it can cope with one environment. When you increase the number of the switch, in two you still have one environment to cope that illuminate the gene, that turn off or turn on the gene, right? If you have three, you can cope with four environment, 
And if you have four switches, you know, we, if you turn two of them and two are uh, down, the combination between those four give you a uh, 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 possibility to cope with different, uh, like 11 different environments that each one you either will uh, turn on or turn off the, the gene. Those switch as the epigenetic sites or uh, CPG site that are within the CPG island. In more uh, cartoon way, so you can have, this is the original, the turn on, brain it's turn on, and red it's turn off the gene. So with aging, it's either you increase the number of CPG islands, meaning you inherited with those places. So if you are centenarians, you probably will have either more CPG islands or more CPG site within those islands, or it's different uh, way of uh, light. And by this, you will either turn off the gene, the combination between those CPG sites, or turn on the gene. So if we take environment one, as you can see, the combination between the CPG site is either methylated or unmethylated. This is methylated or unmethylated. You turn on, and you turn off the gene. And in environment two, you will turn on the gene. So, and in environment three, it's you increase the number of this uh, environment, uh, or environment th uh, three, again, it's another combination that turn off the gene. So when you zoom on, zoom in, sorry, <coughs> those CPG island, so with aging, you increase the CPG island or you inherit it. And how am I going to do this? As first, I want to see how many sites were uh, methylated and this is, I want to expand in the, I will explain with the help of acid that I will perform in one minute. Or sequinome assay, that you just zoom in on a spe specific site and see all the epigenetic site that are turned on and turned off and, the, and either turn on the gene. And this I will uh, learn by QRT. So if I summarize what I see here, what I hypothesize is that in centenarians, they already born with those either extended CPG island or extended CPG side. And if you remember the switch theory, it gives them the flexibility to work in different environment. So that's why we don't see the environmental effect. And think of it, because it's already there when they are, you know, when they were born, they can inherit it to the second generation, to the offspring. So that's why we see that the offspring are healthier than before. They already inherit this. The problem is to prove this. So in order to prove this, what we do now, we have um, whole genome sequence, how many? Well, <laughs> uh, we hold genome sequence, and by whole genome sequence, uh, the centenarians, guys, you can see uh, how many uh, CPG sites are there, and you can compare. Just for the flavor, we have more than 40,000, close to 40,000 CPG island in the human. That's uh, all the epigenetic sites. Okay, you can see the difference between control and centenarians. And I will finish here with the global of uh, uh, survey that uh, people do around the world to understand better why people live longer. So if you live in Japan, it's the fish or the vegetable. China is the green tea or Jing San. 
Um, in France, it's red wine. In Italy, it's pasta. In Greece, it's <laughs> olive oil. And in uh, Caucasus, it's either eat yogurt or simply change your date of birth. <laughs> United States is uh, exercise, and Cuba is cigar, and another component that uh, it's uh, only for 18 plus uh, audience. And in Israel, it's distress. <laughs> and in United States, uh, which uh, simplify our study, it's to be happy. Thank you. centenarians in the Ashkenazi, there is a problem with doing post-mortem in Ashkenazi Jews. It's a lot of work. Don't go into it. But in Germany, what they did is they took 100 years old guys. What they found out that 18% of them die with no uh, explanation. Just they decided to die and they died. <laughs> By the rest, but for the rest, uh, the prevalence of uh, uh, explanatory why they die is the same as all people around the age of 75, like, uh, you know, cardiovascular disease, like pneumonia, or, or other stuff. But that's it. Yeah. Um, I just want to make sure that I understood correctly. You said that there was no effect of lifestyle in the centenarians, but in the regular people, I, I assume there is. I'm not clinician. What I, what, what I showed you is they live to 100 regardless of the lifestyle. Uh -huh. So they smoke, it doesn't affect it. They eat, it doesn't affect it. They are couch potato like everyone else and it doesn't affect it. If it's affect the 90, I believe that the 70 years old, the one that, uh, you know, life expectancy when they get birth, when they, they don't have longevity in the family, and the life expectancy will be 80, it will help them reach this uh, uh, expectation. And if they won't live uh, the good lifestyle, it's my, uh, they, uh, we call it shortevity. They will live less than uh, uh, what expected for them to live. But uh, yeah, for them it doesn't affect, that's what I'm saying. One last question. Did you check also the response? Did you check also the response? In terms of what? Yeah, there is a, no, uh, in the GWAS there is not that much of my mitopolar DNA there. But uh, unfortunately, if the, the ones that are there, there is not significant evidence for, uh, I'd say, over or not a higher uh, prevalence of, of beneficial uh, warning, genetic warning. Asking if the increase with what is age or no, no, no. increase in any any external intervention. Since I believe the uh, epigenetic is the interaction between environment and and the genetic blueprint, and by saying environment, I'm not necessarily squeeze myself environment the outer and the inner. 
environment for me it's also the um, organs, the cell around, the plasma, the inner, even the inner cells can affect this interaction. They can make this interaction. So the question again coming to you, if you're talking about an inner side, if you, if it can be if it is possible, it's possible. But uh, as I said, because the environment is so uh, global, uh, I'm not sure that uh, you won't see the effect regardless the outside. But if you're talking about the theory, the switch theory, what you see is why the lifestyle doesn't change is because they just put a different switch and different uh, that interact with the environment and think if you know the uh, industrial revolution about those flies, not fly, uh, yeah. and how far you know, butterflies that turn from white to black, otherwise they would kill. The same interaction happened with our life. Come on. If we don't change the lifestyle because of the question, question, question. Uh, do we think there are any chances to uh, see this uh, potential of social insects? I mean, the difference in originality. I'm not working with insect, neither with the uh, rodent. Well, I'm starting to work with rodent right now, but even in rodent, there are species or you know, uh, animals that live longer. It's like the naked mole rat that lived to 28 years old. It's like 10 times more than regular mice. And the amazing stuff, and I can show you slides here, is that the naked mole rat live in very stressful environment still they live long. The same happened with the Holidayers uh, Israeli, which is, I don't know, Spalax, I think that's the name. Yeah. He live, it lives to 20 years, and again, very stressful area. He doesn't see, he doesn't, I think he hear, he can hear, but it lives longer. So it's, again, how much is the environment play a role in those creatures to live longer? And as you can uh, probably hear, heard those pollocks doesn't have cancer. Those naked mole rat doesn't have cancer. So if we're going from here to human, I think this is the real model, which shows that there is very heavy epigenetic effect on those guys that just put like a screen on this stressful environment and let them live long.